This is a portrait of a serial killer. A killer that ravages millions each year. Unknown until 1909, the attacker hides inside blood-sucking bugs like these. A single infected bite is a time bomb that can prove lethal decades after the attack. Now, a scientific sleuth scours the archives for new clues and uses police forensics to discover if this executioner felled one of the world's greatest scientists, Charles Darwin. Mystery surrounds the death of the father of the theory of evolution. Can we finally sign his death certificate over 120 years after he died? Charles Darwin is one of the great minds of science. His book on the origin of species and his theory of evolution changed the way humankind looked at its place in the world. But it almost never happened. Darwin's life was plagued by chronic disease. The mystery of his illness has puzzled a century of doctors. Using the power of modern forensic science, this enigma may finally be unraveled. Here at London's Natural History Museum, Dr. Rob McCall is on the trail of Darwin's killer. Charles Darwin has always been a personal hero of mine ever since I came across the idea of evolution at a very young age. Buried on the museum's shelves are creatures first collected by a young naturalist, Charles Darwin. Bizarrely, some of them were kept alive by feeding them human blood. These specimens could hold clues to his sickness a century after his death. Charles Darwin's illness played a really key role in his life. He was ill for much of the period of his life where he was writing the manuscripts that would make him famous. To understand his illness is really to understand how the man worked. So to appreciate Darwin, we really do need to have a better understanding of his illness and its causes. Some Darwin scholars claim his disease was not physical, but the creation of a neurotic mind, a mind full of bottled up stress and anxiety. If we could show that Charles Darwin was in some way physically ill, it would take the emphasis of his mental and anxious nature, reinstate his position as one of the truly great minds of our time, unblemished by this view of him as as some would say, a psychiatric basket case. Whatever the state of Darwin's mind, the ideas it produced were explosive. The world felt the full impact of Darwin's theory of evolution in his book On the Origin of Species. Medical historian and biographer Professor Janet Brown has spent 12 years writing books on Darwin's life and works. It's a tremendous book. Yes, it's, it's absolutely unique. I don't think there can be any other text that's quite so important when it was published, so influential. So yes, it's a, an astonishing book. It's a great book. But it was at great personal cost. Before Darwin, many took the Bible as literal history. The Bible said the earth and its creatures were created in seven days, so that was how long it took. And God said, let there be earth after his kind, and he rested on the seventh day. But Charles Darwin cast doubt on not just this time scale, but on whether there was a creator at all. In The Origin of Species, Darwin's really trying to say that what happens in the farmyard when different breeds are created by the farmer, that this also happens in nature. It removes God from the process completely. Nature itself is creating the species. The process was branded survival of the fittest. Darwin showed that over time, one species could evolve into another. Evolution needed millions of years, not just seven days. Though now widely accepted, in Darwin's day, these ideas were not just radical, they were heresy. Several figures 
said the book was heretical, it was too dangerous to handle, it shouldn't be read by young people or women. Darwin's book generated two enormous questions. What's happened to God? And are we descended from apes? Few men during their own lifetimes can claim to have changed the way humankind viewed itself on the planet. Charles Darwin is one of them. Darwin developed his revolutionary conclusions after five years as a ship's naturalist, studying the wildlife of the Galapagos and South America. Today, as a naturalist on a cruise ship, Dr. Rob McCall brings Darwin's theory alive to a new audience. At Cambridge University, Dr. McCall studied evolution, a subject that might not exist but for Darwin's theories. Though not a medical doctor, he's sure he can solve the riddle of Darwin's long illness. Dr. McCall's travels take him to the very places where Darwin's theory first took shape. My latest journeys have brought me to the west coast of South America, where Darwin landed in the 1830s. And for me, this location might hold the key to the mystery of what actually killed him. I'd always wanted to follow in Darwin's footsteps, but I never realized it was going to be this hard. The guy must have been incredibly fit. Only a few years later, the chances of doing anything like this would have been completely beyond him. This was really his moment of glory before his, his illness just swept down around him and just rendered him almost homebound. Returning to England, Darwin was struck with a mysterious and debilitating illness. At just 30, his fitness was crushed and he became an invalid for life, as his meticulous notes confirm. I am as weak as a child. Everything tires me, even seeing scenery. I've seldom been able to write without interruption from pain for more than 20 minutes. During more than a month, I vomited after several times at night. I seldom throw up any food, only acid and morbid secretion. Oh, health, you are my daily and nightly bugbear and stop all my enjoyment of life. Darwin's theory was born in spite of this grim sickness. Dr. McCall thinks the mountain treks which so inspired Darwin may also hold the key to his physical downfall. In these mighty mountains, Dr. McCall explores not only the cause of his illness, but the passion that drove Darwin to his amazing conclusions. I think one of the great things about Darwin is that he was a sort of combination of a, of a pedant and a poet, really. He could come to a place like this and write exquisite passages describing the, the scenery here and then further go on from that and derive amazing geological theories as to how this landscape was created. And yet, on the other hand, he would become obsessed with minute details such as the, the sexual parts of a barnacle. That, to me, is Darwin's greatness. He's a remarkable man. When we reached the crest and looked backwards, a glorious view was presented. The wild, broken forms produced a scene I never could have imagined. I felt glad I was by myself. It was like watching a thunderstorm or hearing in the full orchestra a chorus of the Messiah. Travelling through these mountains, Darwin was, he was living a rough life, sleeping out under the stars, often in freezing conditions, and continually being bitten by various different parasites. He, he describes on some occasions uh, being so covered in flea bites that it looked like he had freckles. So the man was living an incredibly rough life out here in the Andes. The link between Darwin's illness and his five years in the field 
was first suggested by the Israeli disease specialist, Professor Saul Adler. But Dr. McCall hopes to be the first to use cutting-edge science to prove the theory. Mendoza, Argentina. The place Dr. McCall thinks Darwin contracted his mystery illness from a blood-sucking insect. Darwin's journal yields clues from beyond the grave. He even names the prime suspect. At night, I experienced an attack, for it deserves no lesser name, of the Benchuca, the great black bug of the Pampas. Could this bug have given Darwin the same killer disease that strikes millions today? Zoologist Dr. Rob McCall is hunting for clues to solve a 120-year-old mystery. What caused Charles Darwin's strange illness? He's come to Argentina, to the very place where Charles Darwin traveled. Dr. McCall thinks he's found a likely suspect. Could this bug have given Darwin a disease that caused him 40 years of suffering? Across millions of Latin American homes, the Benchuca bugs hide and wait for their human prey to sleep. But tonight, the humans are hunting the bugs. Dr. McCall teams up with parasite specialist Dr. Roberto Mera from the University of Cuyo to hunt the nocturnal insects. Sheesh. So, I mean, this looks so much like some of the places Darwin was describing in, in the manuscripts. This is a perfect scenario for the Vichuca. It's got a mud brick house, it's got patch roofs, and uh, plenty of hiding places. This is kind of creepy, Roberto. We're looking for these bugs, and I'm not sure if I really want to find one after all we've heard about them. Yeah, it's not a very nice sight. When they get started, they drop themselves off from the ceiling and then fall on their potential prey. Yeah. I think we have yeah, got one. There we go. That's it. Benchuca, at last face to face with the beast that may have killed Charles Darwin. At night, Benchuga bugs fall from the ceiling onto their human prey. Seemingly attracted by carbon dioxide in their sleeping victim's breath, they crawl towards the face. A grim sensation Darwin experiences at first hand. It is most disgusting to feel soft, wingless insects crawling over one's body, gorged with your blood. The eyes are one of the bugs' preferred targets. Where the bugs are rife, every man, woman and child will be bitten at least 20 times a night. It was curious to watch its body during the act of sucking as it changed in less than 10 minutes from being as flat as a wafer to a globular form. Across a year, the hundreds of bugs living in a house will suck out over a liter of blood from each human. A horror hard to imagine. But not only do the Benchuga bugs bring a grim nightly torment, worse, they carry an appalling disease affecting millions of people in Latin America. For 10 years, this disease has been studied by Dr. Roberto Mera. The insect, it bites you, it feeds itself on your blood. When it's full, it defecates on you. When it defecates, it leaves the feces on your skin. You automatically scratch yourself, and when you scratch yourself, you introduce the parasite into your, into your body. <laughs> The parasite is a tiny creature called a trypanosome. This is a motile form. It moves. It moves very fast, but it, it can't reproduce in that form. So it looks for cells. It gets into the cells, and inside the cells, it starts reproducing. 
the trypanosome causes Chagas disease. It was discovered in 1909 by a young Brazilian doctor, Carlos Chagas. The disease is rife across Latin America. It's a very bad disease for an individual, and it's a terrible disease, globally speaking, because millions of people are affected, and the worst thing is the poorest people are the ones that are hit the hardest by this, this parasite. The damage triggered by the parasite rips through the heart or stomach. Most victims have few external signs of their internal distress. But in some, these organs can swell monstrously. The damage can be fatal years later. All this suffering is caused by the tiny parasite. Charles Darwin's illness struck mainly his gut, but Rob discovers that Eduardo and Darwin have many symptoms in common. That's very interesting indeed. Charles Darwin suffered from often from dizzy, uh, fainting spells, um, spots in front of the eyes, noise in the ears. Uh, the symptoms that you're describing to me do sound very similar to some of the symptoms that Charles Darwin was, was showing. Darwin's expansive notes reveal a life blighted by vomiting and stomach cramps. Symptoms strikingly similar to Chagas disease. In Darwin's day, the disease was unknown. So, if we could go inside Darwin's body, would his organs be ravaged by Chagas disease? Dr. McCall thinks they would. This woman, Florencia Bravo, fears the damage Chagas disease can do. She's seen Benchuca bugs in her home and is scared she may already be infected. If Florencia has the disease, her life could mirror Eduardo's. But worse still, she's seven months pregnant. The parasite may have infected the child she's carrying, even before it's born. Thankfully, unlike Charles Darwin, Florencia can be tested for Chagas disease. Treatment is still possible if Chagas disease is caught very early. Her doctor needs fresh blood for the test, which would clearly be impossible to collect from Charles Darwin. But Dr. McCall thinks he may have a way around this. I discovered there was a new test for Chagas disease in Brazil, a new test that could finally offer an answer to the question, what killed Charles Darwin? With this news, I went to Brazil to find out more. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Here, the authorities are attempting to control Chagas disease. In Latin America, 18 million people suffer from Chagas disease. Imagine six cities the size of Chicago, all crippled by sickness. In Latin America, Chagas disease is 10 times more common than HIV. Like HIV, it hits the poor very hard. But unlike HIV, there's virtually no research into a cure. And the only two drugs available have serious side effects. Dr. Mary Moran of Doctors Without Borders describes their drawbacks. Not only do they not work in one out of three patients, but they're teratogenic. That means that if you're a woman, if there's any risk, you're pregnant, that your fetus could be malformed. They have uh, a lot of side effects. Um, in fact, they were originally developed as veterinary drugs for pets, and I think the, the kind of uh, side effect profile we see partly reflects that. In the last quarter century, there's been 1,200 new drugs developed, and that's for people like you and me, for cancer, diabetes, so forth. But for tropical diseases, there's only been 11 new drugs. Of these 11, half were never designed for human use and several were discovered purely by chance. You can't really completely ignore the rest of humanity. I think as a doctor I find that uh, impossible to believe that we can think that's an acceptable way forward. But one factor may force drug companies to focus on Chagas disease. It is heading north. It now sweeps from Chile all the way to the south of the USA. Bugs carrying the parasite have been found throughout many southern states. 
one man the US government turned to for advice is Dr. David Leiby, flight specialist at the American National Red Cross. Diseases that perhaps we or other developed countries once thought were not our problem are now appearing in our own backyard. And I think when that begins to occur, then our consciousness is raised and we realize that we are a global world. Chagas disease is normally spread by Ventuca bugs, but not in the U.S. Here, it's spread inadvertently. Well, there have been reports estimating how many people in the United States actually have Chagas disease, and the number that is usually used is approximately 100,000 individuals. The disease is coming from outside America, inside human carriers. But what we're mostly concerned about is the people who are, who are emigrating to the United States are the ones that are, in fact, bringing the parasite here. Though the disease is not contagious, it is spreading in the U.S., and not by a conventional route, but through the 15 million blood donations each year. Well, one of our missions, actually, at the Red Cross and Lisa and our Department of Transmissible Diseases is to look into the future and see what issues might be of grave concern to the blood supply. But the fact that this infection and this disease lasts a lifetime, uh, it's going to be an ongoing problem for many, many years. Currently, the Red Cross estimates there are 600 infected units of blood given out each year. If a patient caught the disease from a blood transfusion, would a U.S. doctor recognize it? My guess is that in most medical schools in this country, uh, when Chagas disease is covered in the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi, it may get a mention of one or two minutes in a, one lecture within uh, one year of their, of their schooling. If Chagas disease is not diagnosed and treated within the first month, it becomes virtually incurable. Today, U.S. patients could be given infected blood with little or no hope that their doctor will recognize these vital symptoms before it's too late. Virtually every country in the Americas tests donated blood for Chagas disease to avoid this potential nightmare. Surprisingly, the U.S. does not. In part, the real problem is that there are no licensed tests by the uh, Food and Drug Administration that we could use, even if we wish to test the blood. The U.S. administration needs a fast, accurate test to license. A strong contender is the very test that Dr. McCall is investigating in Brazil. Having been so close to infected Bantuca bugs, I was keen to have myself tested for the disease, something Charles Darwin could not have done. And Professor Ferreira, a leading light in the fight against Chagas disease, was the man for the job. Professor Walter Ferreira is pioneering a quick diagnostic test for the millions of potential Chagas victims in Brazil. Defense systems in our blood react to parasites by making antibodies. These tiny proteins latch onto the parasite. Chagas disease antibodies are a unique shape. If a person has Chagas disease, Professor Ferreira's sensitive test will track down these antibodies. But unlike other tests, it is so sensitive it can respond to dried samples, perhaps even samples from the dead. So what kind of sample do you need to diagnose Chagas disease? Do you need blood, hair, saliva? What, what, what kind of sample would be good? We can do the test with uh, one drop of blood. But when you have a small quantity of, uh, of blood, you can lose the sensitivity of the test. Dr. McCall asks if the test is sensitive enough to test Charles Darwin's blood if only tiny amounts still exist. Charles Darwin. <laughs> no one knows if the test will work, but the professor wants to try. Now Rob McCall must find a piece of Charles Darwin, a man buried in Westminster Abbey over a century ago. Zoologist Dr. Rob McCall is hunting for forensic samples of a man who died more than a century ago, Charles Darwin. If he can find a sample, he can diagnose Darwin over a century after his death. Eighteen thirty-six, 
As Charles Darwin returns to England, his thoughts focus on evolution. Dangerous, revolutionary thoughts. Thoughts that would torment him. Darwin is fully aware of the tremendous damage his evolution theory will do to the church. He compares his theory to confessing a murder with God the Creator as victim. It is perhaps ironic that Darwin, who said his theories made him the devil's chaplain, is buried in Britain's most prestigious church, Westminster Abbey. Well, here, six feet down, lie the mortal remains of Charles Darwin. If we were looking for samples for Professor Ferreira's test, this would have to be the place to come. If London's police were hunting Darwin's killer, they would seek an exhumation warrant from the coroner, Dr. Paul Knapman. In England and Wales, it is not an easy thing to exhume a body. It has to be done strictly in accordance with the law. You would have to show me good reason of criminality or suspicion concerning the death of Charles Darwin. And even if you show, the fact is that he died uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Any possibility of any person being alive and connected with the death is extinct. And so, frankly, I don't think there'd be any reason at all for a coroner to issue his warrant, even if there had been suspicion at the time of the death of Charles Darwin. I wouldn't have thought you would be able to uh, give me any reasons why I would issue a warrant for his exhumation. I'm sorry to uh, disappoint you. Undeterred, Dr. McCall hunts for clues in these vast vaults, the final resting place of Darwin's preserved beasts. It's frustrating that a naturalist whose life was dedicated to preserving specimens seems not to have preserved any part of himself. The drops of blood inside Benchuka bugs may hold a secret. Darwin trapped Benchuka bugs and sent them back to England. His notes suggest they fed on his own blood. Here in the vault of London's Natural History Museum, Dr. McCall tracks these bugs. Twice Darwin writes about these captured Benchuga bugs. Blood inside the bugs could show if they carried Chagas disease. And yet here in the museum, I can find no trace of them. With no chance of exhuming Darwin's body and the fruitless search for Darwin's Benchuga bugs, the trail appears to be running cold. Charles Darwin's illness was as much a mystery to him as to Dr. McCall. Throughout his life, Darwin resorted to some extreme cures. He took arsenic, strychnine, and opium, sometimes mixed with cinnamon to make it palatable. To recuperate, Darwin travels here to Moor Park. And undergoes a revolutionary treatment called hydrotherapy. The Moor Park treatment gave him temporary relief from his illness. He became an eager advocate of hydrotherapy, even fitting a 3,000 litre shower to his house to blast himself with cold water. But despite these wild treatments, he remained stubbornly ill for year after year. Most disconcerting in society. Even at the height of his illness, the naturalist inside Darwin was unstoppable. A gardener told Darwin that climbing plants must have eyes in their tendrils to be able to find objects to support them. Despite being virtually bedridden, Darwin set out to disprove this by watching the plants grow. After hundreds of hours of studying, he could describe the precise mechanism used. This incredibly obsessive nature causes some doctors 
to think that Darwin's illness was not in his blood, but in his mind. Professor Simon Wesley is a psychiatrist at London's Maudsley Hospital. Today, if Darwin appeared at the professor's clinic, he would hold few surprises. I'm a professor of psychiatry, and I think the kind of problems that Darwin presented with are very familiar. And I do see quite a lot of patients who resemble Charles Darwin in many things other than his scientific genius, in whom doctors don't ever find evidence of clear-cut disease and who often doctors find difficult to help. Everyone tells me I look blooming and beautiful. Many think I'm shamming, I think. Darwin's symptoms certainly were a form of health anxiety, or hypochondriasis, as sometimes called. The question, I guess, for doctors is why? Was he anxious about his health because he had a chronic physical disease and had every reason to be, or was his illness actually his anxiety? And I tend to form the latter, that actually his anxiety was his problem. My health almost always suffered from excitement, violent shiverings and vomiting attacks being thus brought on. For Darwin, illness obviously caused him tremendous symptoms and suffering, there's no dispute about that, but it also had its uses. And that may be one of the reasons why he, had, he was ill for so long. And there are many examples in which uh, he is able to avoid him because of his illness. I was advised by a friend never to get entangled in a controversy, as it rarely does any good and causes a miserable loss of time and temper. Darwin was a very quiet, modest man and really didn't like public display cut and thrust. He withdrew from any kind of fight, even in his personal life as well as in his professional life. So he was quite the wrong kind of person to be the front man for evolutionary theory. Now, how does he get round this? Normally you go to scientific meetings, you present your theories and people jump on you. Now Darwin couldn't cope with that. And on numerous occasions, his symptoms save him from these difficult situations. That main symptoms in the first place but my God, it was certainly very useful to him. I feel that the illness perhaps did contribute in some way towards the reception of the origin of species, possibly even just by keeping Darwin at home and letting that debate rage widely. So was Darwin's illness all in his head, a means to get out of awkward situations? Rob McCall is not convinced. I could see that Charles Darwin had hypochondriac tendencies. I could also imagine that he was an obsessive personality from the way he went at his work. But the thing I still find really difficult to swallow is the idea that those gastric symptoms that he had were as severe as they were. Vomiting every day, three or four times a day, for 27, 28 days on end, and then maybe for months after that. That, to me, it just doesn't sound like a man who is purely mentally ill. There's another scientist who thinks Darwin's illness was physical, and he wants to prove it. Geneticist Dr. Robert Fleischer studies birds at the Smithsonian Zoo, but realized he could adapt his techniques to look at Darwin's illness. I was um, actually pretty taken aback by the level of interest that I saw in what was this disease that plagued Darwin. So what I thought was, as a scientist was that maybe there was some way we could actually get a more concrete answer to the question of what Darwin had. Dr. Fleischer went hunting. Basically I was looking for, in a sense, little bits of Darwin that remain to this day. He went to examine Darwin's notebooks. As a field biologist, I've done a fair amount of field work. I know that there are times when you're doing field work and recording things in your notebook and you can cut yourself accidentally with your pocket knife or something. So I thought that would be a place I could look and see um, if there was any evidence. When I, I first looked and opened up a notebook and saw what looked like a blood stain, I thought, this looks like a blood stain. I, maybe I found it. And I got very excited and interested. Now, Dr. Fleischer could subject these blood stains to a test for Chagas disease. 
the test is a is a search for any evidence that, that the parasite was present in the blood of Darwin. The test looks at DNA. Human DNA is different from trypanosome DNA. If there was any trypanosome DNA in the blood, it would show Darwin had the disease. But Dr. Fleischer can find no evidence for Chagas disease. A negative result is not that meaningful because with a disease like this, there's a lot of reasons why you might not pick it up even if the person has it. This blood sample fails to yield positive results. So Dr. McCall heads for what looks like the last remaining avenue for samples. In Cambridge, at the very college where Darwin studied, Dr. McCall searches for any sample for Professor Ferreira's Brazilian antibody test. One of the wonderful things about Charles Darwin is he has left the most monumental paper trail for us to follow. He was the writer of over 14,000 letters, countless manuscripts, uh, countless publications. Darwin was an incredible character in terms of making meticulous notes of virtually everything that happened to him and writing those notes down. He made notes of every solitary symptom. This was all noted down in notebooks that have survived to this day. So we have a unique insight into his health history. With so much written material available concerning Charles Darwin, so much written in his own hand that we can find here in the archives, it's an incredible thought to think that we might actually be able to find uh, some organic sample of the man himself present in here amidst all of the letters and manuscripts that he wrote. Every place we go, in every step we make, we humans leave minute traces of our visits. Throughout his life, Charles Darwin would have deposited about 300 kilos of skin. And every year, his head would have grown over 12 kilometers of hair. Each day, he would have secreted over one and a half liters of saliva. For Professor Ferreira's test, Dr. McCall must hunt for antibodies. A human produces only a few grams of these each day. These tiny proteins are found throughout our bodies. Dr. McCall is hunting for some artifacts that Darwin may have come into contact with. The remains are likely to be minuscule, and the search will not be easy. No exhumation, no benchuga bugs, no samples. Rob looked out of luck. But then, he realized he had the eye's hands. Rob discovered that even the very earliest stamps had to be licked, and saliva contains antibodies. And Professor Ferreira's test needs antibodies. Could the answer be contained in the single lick of a stem? In Cambridge, envelopes were deemed too precious to test. In Philadelphia, the attitude is more receptive. At the American Philosophical Society, the largest Darwin collection outside Britain, the head of manuscripts is Robert Cox. The collection of Darwin letters is around 900 to 1,000 items. 1,000 letters do not have 1,000 envelopes. Envelopes are not something people keep very often. In fact, in, in a lot of archives, are simply routinely thrown out. But this archive was not like the others. In part of our collection, there was a group of envelopes that had been saved simply because they were written in Darwin's hand. 
we don't know exactly what happened before they arrived here, but since they've come here, they've been kept in uh, very good condition. No light, uh, constant temperature, constant humidity. You know, the forensic scientists will have to tell you whether it's appropriate to try to pull DNA from something like that. Now, experts in forensic science arrive. Philadelphia's police force. They're used to extracting tiny DNA samples as evidence from objects like envelopes. Ron McCoy has had 16 years' experience on the force. What I'm doing is trying to remove uh, whatever material that was left from the licking of the envelope. So I'm using a saline solution on a swab to remove the material. And what we generally do is just swab the, the surface of the envelope and prepare it for testing. Try to be very careful as to not to tear the envelope apart. We don't have things that come from antiquity or aged materials generally. We do not know whether he would have licked an envelope or a stamp, whether he would have had a spun, or whether he had a servant uh, to lick the envelope for him. I think it increases the likelihood that he might have had personal tongue contact with an envelope if he, in fact, wrote the address. To trigger Professor Ferreira's test, the tiny antibodies will have had to survive over a century outside the human body. The swabs are sliced in two. One half will be DNA fingerprinted to verify it is Darwin's saliva. The other sent for antibody testing. This experiment is pioneering and no one knows the chances of its success. From what I've heard about it, it, it it's similar to uh, taking a bow and arrow and trying to hit one of the stars. So good luck to you. Our samples will be tested for Chagas disease using Professor Ferreira's Brazilian antibody test. Is Ron correct? Are we just shooting for the stars? Dr. Rob McCall has traveled the world hunting for the clues that might give up a secret from beyond the grave. Finally, 120 years later, are we close to discovering what may have caused Charles Darwin's mysterious illness? Professor Ferreira's colleagues have carried out the antibody test. The results that reveal the answer are going to Dr. Rob McCall in London, England. It's the end of a long journey. It's really hard to describe how I'm feeling right now. We're kind of on the cusp of solving a mystery that's existed for well over a hundred years. It's a magic moment. In the next few minutes, we may know what Darwin and a century's worth of doctors never knew. The secret of his illness. First, Dr. McCall must check the saliva on the envelopes is really Charles Darwin's. Extracted DNA from the samples have been compared to DNA from a descendant of Darwin. Right, okay. This is saying that the get this, the envelope that we that we did took all the trouble to swab. Uh, we haven't been able to find a positive match for Charles Darwin's DNA in that envelope. So that's either saying that it definitely wasn't Darwin who licked the envelope, or the sample is so degraded that we can't identify exactly whose DNA it was in the envelope. I don't feel that we've fully exhausted the possibility that he was suffering from Chagas disease. So it's, it's back to the laboratory and back to more testing as far as I'm concerned. So Dr. McCall cannot sign Darwin's death certificate. But this is not the case for millions of Latin American Chagas victims. The Benchuca bugs have already sealed their fate. For them, the chances of a cure today are little better than they were in Darwin's day. Darwin suffered for much of his life, and it should be seen as all the more remarkable that he managed to produce such great work. 
I don't mind open-endedness. In biology, you have a strain of biologists who believe that everything comes down to molecules. Uh, in history, you have historians who believe that everything comes down to nuts in either of those two camps. Uh, I enjoy the open-endedness, and I think even when things appear to be cut and dried, oftentimes they're really, truly very open. The disease that cursed Darwin until his painful last hours remains an enigma. But then so does Darwin himself. A courageous, brave man who faced the venom of religious society, yet ducked personal confrontation. A peculiar combination of a brilliant poetic writer with an obsessive analytical mind. And one of the most famous names of his generation, who shunned the limelight. Charles Darwin's ideas did not die with him, but have continued to develop and inspire. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution has stood the test of time and continues to be one of the most powerful ideas science has ever produced.